Oh. Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and um, thank you for joining us today for the fourth in our five-part webinar series on the road to COP26 and in advance of the, the launch of a report that CBBC have been compiling in partnership with KPMG and other CBBC member companies um, over the past couple of months, um, which will be released during COP26 in Glasgow and in Beijing. I am delighted to, to be here um, with you and I'd like to uh, kick off today's session, which is looking at green finance um, with a presentation by Mr. Maidowen. And uh, before we, we get to the actual presentation itself, I just want to um, invite you to use the question and answer box um, or the chat function to ask uh, questions and also to make you aware that there is interpretation available um, for this morning's session and the first presentation will be delivered in Chinese so if you are a non-Chinese um, speaker please um, go to the interpretation box to switch that to English for the first presentation um, after the first presentation we will revert to uh, predominantly, predominantly English. Um, so, again, if you're a non-English speaker, you can then revert to Chinese. Um, you can ask questions in either English or Chinese, and I will endeavour to incorporate those questions in um, in the session. Um, today's Green Finance webinar is sponsored by HSBC and we have a representative of, of HSBC later on on our moderated panel um, in Antoine de Guilibon. And um, before we, we get to that stage, as I say, I'm going to invite a general manager of the China Beijing Green Exchange, Mr. Meido Wen. Um, to present to us uh, an update on the exciting area of carbon trading in China, which, as you will be aware, is is a key source of dealing with um, source one emissions and uh, a key element of green finance, um, which is sometimes um, overlooked and has been developing rapidly in China over the past few years, and, and notably this year. Um, we saw the launch of a nationwide carbon trading um, exchange. So over to Mr. May, uh, who will present on this topic. Thank you. Oh, uh, 做一个介绍 它这个面临的背景呢 
二零零八年和二零一八年大约十年时间，欧盟碳交易市场的价格呢，哎、呃，都低于两位数。这是我们讲我们中国碳市场第一个背景。那么第二个背景呢，哎、呃，我们认为中国碳市场还是很有希望的。一个重要的原因是中国呢，现在呢是，呃，世界上最大的风光装机总量的国家。中国的风光装机总量世界第一，五点三四亿千瓦。另外呢，这个我们的电动车也是很大的，还有我们具有世界上最大的绿色信贷市场和碳市场的一级市场。呃，这是说这是这是说这个背景的。那么我们现在说到中国碳市场的现状，中国碳市场呢，我们知道从二零零五年开始呢，中国参与这个 CDM 市场。呃，从二零一三年到这个二零二零年，这个这七八年时间呢，我们开始做这个呃区域碳交易试点，在这个天津、沪、渝四大直辖市和广东、湖北、深圳，还有后来的福建，我们开始做这个呃做这个这个这个这个呃区域试点。那么这个八个试点呢，这配额呢，一共是十二亿吨。总共大约是三千家单位，呃，参与这个配额，呃，这八年八个试点的总的交易量四点八亿吨，累计成交金额一百一十四亿，平均成交价格呢，呃，不到二十四元人民币，换手率百分之五，啊，这是说我们这个，呃，这个过去的这样的一个八个碳交易试点，它的现状。那么从今年开始呢，中国在电力行业开展了碳交易试点，也就是说，年排放量两万六千吨二氧化碳以上的电力企业开始做碳交易，大约是两千一百六十二家电力企业。呃，目前两个多月的交易量啊，两个多月的交易量呢，截止到九月二十四号，这个已经开通的中国全国碳交易市场，它的这样的一个累计成交量呢，八百四十八万吨。成交额四点一八亿，成交价格，呃，差不多五十块钱人民币，五十块人民币。那么我们对比一下子中国碳市场跟这个欧盟碳市场，我刚才说了，就是我们区域碳交易试点八年八个履约期，累计成交量一百一十四亿人民币，呃，这个一四点八亿吨，成交价格呢不到二十四块人民币。那么欧盟碳市场去年。八十四八十一亿吨二氧化碳，它是超过两千亿欧元，呃，所以我们目前中国碳市场的这样的一个交易规模、交易价格、交易流动性呢，呃，跟那个欧盟碳市场呢还有很大的差距。那么最后一两分钟呢，我也说一说这个，呃，下一步啊，呃，中国中国碳市场的这样一个展望，呃，展望呢，呃，我们说呢，首先。在交易主体上，我们目前中国碳市场就只有一个行业，电力行业。那么未来可能会在电力、石化、化工、建材、钢铁、有色、造纸、航空八大行业会加入中国碳市场。那么会，这中国碳市场的配额呢，会从目前的这个四十亿吨配额，扩大到八十亿吨配额以上。那么交易主体也会从现在的这样的一个只有一个主体，控牌企业、电力行业，会增加到金融机构。那么交易产品呢？我们认为未来呢，中国碳市场呢也会增加金融产品。另外呢，我们觉得中国碳市场的这个，呃，就是所谓的这样的一个，呃，监管吧，呃，监管的话呢，应该是也是走走向这样的一个国际化，走向国际化。所以这就是我我们对于中国碳市场未来的这个判断：主体更加多元化、规模化，会走向八十亿吨的配额；产品会增加这样的一个期货产品。未来，那么监管呢会更加透明化、更加国际化。呃，会从不仅是说在一级市场是世界上最大的市场，那么在二级市场呢，中国碳市场也会变成世界上最大的碳市场。呃，这里面逻辑什么呢？逻辑就是，呃，就是这样有一个所谓的，呃，金融的蒙代尔、特勒戈曼不可能三角，就是金融的不可能三角。呃，这是因为呢，气候变化具有全球外部性，碳排放权天然具有国际自由流动的属性。中国呢，肯定要保持对于低碳政策的独立性，那么碳价格呢，一定会走向国际趋同。那么中国碳交易市场呢，未来的交易规模、交易价格、交易流动性，在金融不可能三角这样的一个理论
呃自身之下，在欧盟和美国正在探讨 C 霸姆，也就是欧盟要探讨的这个碳边境调节机制，以及国际民航组织要推出国际民航。减排抵消与交易机制，也就是 c o s e r 高 c o s e r 从二零零一年到二零二四年是四点，二零二四年到二零二六年是第一个阶段，那么二零二七年是强制阶段。总之呢，我们认为呢，在这样的一个金融不可能三角理论，在欧盟、美国在探讨推出碳边境调节机制，以及国际民航要推出 c o s e r 这几大背景下呢，哎、呃，那么我们认为中国碳的价格啊。可能会从按照我们清华大学张西良教授的团队认为，中国碳交易市场的价格今年五十块钱，二零三零年呢会到达十五美元至十五美元左右，二零三五年会到达二十五美元左右，二零五零年可能会到达一百一十五美元左右，二零六零年中国碳出口的时候可能会超过两百美元以上。呃，这就是说我们对于中国碳市场的一个基本判断。呃，最后呢，我想一句话结束我们今天的发言呢。对于中国碳市场呢，我们认为呢，呃，这个我一再说了，呃，经经历了 CDM 市场阶段，经历了区域试点阶段，那么下一步呢，会走向现在正在走向这个全国的碳现货试点，未来呢可能会走向碳期货。我们的交易主体、交易规模、交易价格、交易流动性。呃，应该会有更大的想象空间。呃，这个主要的依据就是这个，呃，我最后简单说，主要依据就是，首先，中国是最大的碳排放国家，中国是最大的能耗国家，中国是最大的发展中国家，但是，中国也是世界上最大的新能源国家，最大的特高压国家，最大的这个电动车国家，也是最大的绿色信贷市场国家，还是最大的。碳市场国家，在这样的背景之下，我们对中国碳市场还是非常有信心的，非常有希望的。这就是最后一句，我们美国硅谷的有个名言，就是“人们总是高估一个新技术、新事物的短期影响力，而低估它的长期影响力”。也许碳市场就是这样的一个新事物。好，谢谢金老师，谢谢各位。梅老师，非常感谢您。呃，刚。刚给了那个报告，呃，我我想呃问一下，到现在为止，呃，今年这个全国的呃碳交易呃市场开开业了，呃，到现在为止有没有外资公司参与这个呃交易市场？哎、呃，是这样啊，就是说，呃，中国碳市场呢，目前呢就是，呃，首先啊，我刚才说中国碳市场。呃，在这个二零一三年到二零到到现在为止，呃，我们现在实际上两个市场，一个是全国性的配额交易市场，呃，这个主要针对于电力行业，呃，这个我没有查这个具体的名单。如果是，呃、比如说外资公司在中国开设的电厂，只要它的排放超过呃一万吨标煤，也就是说两万六千吨二氧化碳，那么它肯定也是要加入这个碳市场的。嗯另外呢，因为中国碳市场目前只有一个主体，就是电力行业，呃，比如说非电力行业那还没有，包括金融机构都还没有。但是呢，我们相信未来，呃，只要是外资公司在中国设的法人实体，比如说呃，电力、石化、化工、建材、钢铁、有色、造纸、航空这八大行业，未来只要是年排放量超过两万六千吨以上的。不管是外资还是内资还是民企，呃，应该都要纳入这个碳市场。这第一，第二呢，中国从二零一三年开始呢，在京津沪渝四大直辖市和广东、湖北、深圳还有福建这八个省市开展碳交易试点。这个试点呢，跟配合市场呢是共同开展的，目前还在进行之中。那么，只要是外资在这八个地区，他如果说，你说像北京就特别严，北京是。只要这个碳排放，这个五千吨以上的，五千吨以上的这个都都会纳入到这个呃控排。我相信呢，这个呃，在这八个省市啊，它的外资企业应该呢，呃，会进入到这个中国的呃区域试点市场，好吧？谢谢金老师。
谢谢，嗯，梅老师，哎，您您说到这个区域市场，呃，虽然现在有一个全国的市场，那些区域市场还会继续进行吗？哎、呃，对，这些区域试点呢，跟跟这个中国的全国碳市场呢是，呃，是相向而行，这个共同共同举行。如果说呢，哎、呃，更大规模的。这个电力行业呢，呃，就不在这个区域试点进行了，就在这个，呃，就在这个全国碳市场进行。以比如说以北京为例，呃，一万吨标煤，也就是两万六千吨二氧化碳排放量以上的电力企业，就进入到全国碳市场。除此之外，原来北京开展的那些区域试点的控排单位，仍然在北京碳市场进行交易，所以。中国碳市场目前是两个市场，一个是全国性的市场，因为另外就是那个京津沪渝四大直辖市加上广东、湖北、深圳和福建这八个省市，仍然在开展区域碳交易试点。好，呃，不好意思，那现在我们到到时间，呃，不能再再再谈，但是非常感谢，嗯、呃，梅老师今天给我们的这个报告，嗯、呃。我希望我们会继续交流，呃，和呃，更呃，更呃，了解这个中国的呃碳交易市场，因为非常重要的一那个呃绿色金融的一一一个部分。好 ，OK， 嗯、um, ，好 ，Thank you， 好，谢谢谢谢谢谢杰姆斯，哎，谢谢各位 ，Thank you。Okay, thank you, Mr. May. Um, that was a fascinating insight into one of the the key mechanisms for controlling um emissions from from the power um generation sector. And、uh, as Mr. May outlined, the the price of carbon in in China has still got some way to go、uh, before. Before it reaches、uh, that of the carbon market in in Europe and North America, but、um, uh, with also the context that he painted of of、uh, you know the fact that China is the biggest polluter,、um, but it's also the biggest market for renewable energy, and it's also the biggest、uh, issuer of of green bonds, and、uh, it's been hugely、um, ambitious in. In green finance, more more broadly, I think,、um, and we've got three more speakers to discuss、uh, other aspects of of green finance、um, in in China now,、um, and I'll invite them one by one just to to introduce themselves.、Um, but the first first of our three speakers I'd like to introduce is、uh, Elaine Su from、uh, the British Embassy in Beijing. Who's the policy lead、um, for the International Climate Fund and the UK Pact、uh, China Green Finance Program?、Um, Elaine, would you like to、uh, just give us a, a, a very brief、uh, introduction to yourself、um, before I、uh, introduce Antoine?、Um, following. Thank you, James.、Um, hello, everyone. My name is Elian Si, and、uh, my Chinese name is Jia Ling.、Uh, I'm the policy lead uh, for uh, International Climate Fund UK Pact program. So、uh, our program uh, is a、uh, um, five million pounds uh, uh, assistance program in China,、uh, focusing purely on green finance. So the program has been、uh, run for、um, for three years. Since 2018,、uh, we support、uh, China's green finance more、uh, kind of like transparent and more、uh, up to standard to the international standard. We also、uh, host a lot of capacity buildings、uh, for domestic market and also overseas market along China's overseas investment. Uh, for example, uh, maybe you are familiar with、uh, green investment pr principles,、uh, also green uh, investment uh, guidance, uh, which is uh, China's biggest like、uh, domestic uh, investment policy.、Um, 
So myself, so my work is on the policy analysis by looking at both China's uh, and the UK's green finance development and uh, trying to seek the opportunities, see where is the angle that we can collaborate more closely, uh, which bringing uh, more um, um, more uh, like influence to the policymakers in China, uh, as well as bringing commercial opportunities for a UK business who is in China. So I will uh, perhaps later talk about like uh, specific areas of this. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, Antoine, um, I'd like to introduce you next. Uh, so Antoine is the Head of Strategy and Planning at HSBC China, um, and I will leave it to you to, to, to introduce a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much, James, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, to this uh, fantastic panel. Um, I, I look forward to a lively debate on this fascinating topic. Um, yes, so, so I'm head of strategy for HSBC in China. I've been in this job here in China for two years now. Um, um, HSBC is um, has been present in China for over 150 years. Um, we serve uh, both uh, retail and, um, and corporate customers across uh, China um, uh, with, a, with a big focus um, on you know, cross-border business here. This is clearly the, the, um, the, uh, the added value that we bring to the Chinese market, both on the inbound side and the outbound side. When it comes to, um, to sustainability, so one of my responsibilities is to coordinate our ESG agenda across, uh, across the bank. Um, there is clearly um, a sentiment in China that, that um, Europe is, um, is, is more mature uh, in, this, uh, in this field than, than China, even though China is doing a lot of catching up and really fast. Um, and so um, I, I see HSBC as, you know, um, being um, being uh, really a thought leader uh, in this in this respect in this field when it comes to um, sustainable financing. So we're aggressively um, pushing this agenda, um, both with our retail customers and our, our, our corporate customers, and supporting them through their transition journey to, to green. This is for me, look forward to telling you more. Thank you, Antoine, that's great. And last but certainly not least, um, I'd like to introduce Kathy Lee, who is one of 26 um, One Step Greener ambassadors as designated by, by UK government, um, which is a scheme to promote, um, I, I guess, exemplars within um, UK civic society in, in uh, tackling climate change. And, and Kathy has been an active um, member of the UNFCCC's uh, working groups over the last uh, few years as, as a volunteer and uh, in particular an advocate for uh, youth and, and women uh, within those structures. Um, so it's bringing quite a different angle. Um, she's, she's Chinese, but she lives in the UK um, and very involved and very busy at the moment, I think, in the, in the build up to COP26. So it'd be really interesting to hear um, your insight. From, from that perspective, but um, please give us a, a bit more about yourself and, and how, how, how you've uh, fit into this whole picture. Yeah, thanks, James. And I think that's um, a very um, generous introduction of me. So as James mentioned that I am one of the um, One Step Greener Ambassadors, and I also follow the UNFCCC, which is UN Climate Change, um, the process and negotiations. And I speak on behalf of youth and women uh, constituencies in some of the meetings and negotiations. Um, and, and also that interestingly, this is such um, an interesting year for both UK and China. And, um, climate and biodiversity negotiations. So of course, um, quite busy um, days ahead for both uh, the UN negotiations for COP26 and also um, interestingly by profession, I work in private finance in a non-climate team. So also busy days on that side as well. So, so yeah, that's a brief um, introduction about myself. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Um... I might like to, to start our conversation, um, uh, seeing as we're, we're talking about uh, COP26 and, and uh, you'll also be aware that COP15, um, the, the biodiversity equivalent, um, was also um, hosted by, by, by China this year, um, although it's been, the physical event has been 
curtailed and postponed somewhat um, uh, on two occasions. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I, I wanted to ask a first question to LAN in, in terms of um, what impact, if any, you think that both the hosting of COP15 in, by China and, and the hosting of COP26 by, by the UK, um, uh, how much impact has there been on UK to China government to government collaboration in, in green finance? Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, um, so actually, um, the UK and China are leading the way on developing green finance globally. Uh, the UK was the first uh, major economy to legislate for net zero by 2050. And China, as we know, that has set its carbon neutrality goals by 2030 and 2060. These are uh, vital steps to demonstrate the determinations of the both countries uh, to tackle uh, climate change. And both COP15 and COP26 are the critical political moments uh, for us to showcase to the world that the UK and China's leading role in this area. Uh, however, I would say that actually this mo momentum between two countries are not built uh, in one day. Um, actually, in China, since 2015, President Xi's campaign of ecological civilization uh, has already put green finance at the heart of the policy two box to fight against the environmental pollution and uh, now increasingly climate change. It was also at the same time that uh, led by um, Hani, the governor of uh, the former governor of Bank of England published um, a report on the impact of climate change in insurance sector in 2015, which indicates that insurance sector at that time in the UK is the third largest in the world actually have an impact on the whole financial stability. So that, in, uh, that report actually quickly gained attraction in China uh, leading to deepening a collaboration on green finance uh, that same year. And uh, later in 2016, inspired the UK and China co-chairing of the G20 Green Finance Study Group. So uh, under the, like China's G20 presidency. So since then, actually UK China has already uh, uh, always been working together on this same agenda. Um, and you know, like UK and China has a really high level presidency level uh, dialogue called the UK China Economic Financial dialogue. Uh, yeah. And at the ninth and the 10th EFD, the UK and China formally recognized each other as the primary partner in green finance for uh, capital raising, product innovation, and thought leadership. So the agreed of uh, a set of joint priorities, which are now actually being supported by our program, UK PAP program. So we are focusing on uh, raising, for example, transparency of the market, uh, such as like uh, promoting TCFD as a framework in the market uh, for uh, information, uh, finance, uh, environment related financial disclosure. Uh, we are uh, further like uh, standardize China's green bond investment guidelines uh, in terms with, uh, with UK and the EU's uh, green, uh, green bond guidelines and the green taxonomies. Uh, also kind of investment on uh, China's overseas ma uh, market. So uh, I think really COP26 and COP15 this year are the opportunities to uh, make this collaboration go further and deeper. Um, for example, China has done a lot, especially entering this year. We can see um, since China announced this carbon neutrality goal, China last week also made an announcement of stop coal financing overseas. And after that, immediately, Bank of China, the one of the top four banks in China, also announced that they will stop coal financing from quarter three this year. Um, so that is like amazing achievement actually in run up to COP26 is exactly the, the kind of thing that we, the world would like to say. Um, and also going forward, we think um, according to China's uh, like momentum this year, uh, but, uh, China's central bank, PBOC governor Yi Gang made a speech and already uh, kind of like state that China's China financial institutions will interim mandatory disclosure uh, regime and also in, will be recommended to, to use task force for climate related financial disclosure framework. So that is exactly what in line with what UK is trying is doing at the moment. Uh, we know that UK has already mandated the whole uh, economy uh, like for financial related disclosure in line with TCFD by 2025. Actually, most of the large, largest like enterprises will be a mandatory disclosure by 2022. So this is definitely the area that the UK and China can work uh, closely to drive the 
or like uh, standardization. Um, another area, given that. Could we, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the just, last bit. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. The last bit is the COP15 uh, in relation to biodiversity finance is also kind of like an area that at the moment, uh, China's like leading finance uh, person, uh, Dr. Ma Jun, has already established a working group with UK, like Neil Robbins, uh, like doing the research on this one. So there are a lot of like opportunities uh, building up this momentum after COP. So that's for me. Thanks. Thank you, Elaine. There's a lot to un un unpick there, um, uh, but it sounds like uh, COP26 and COP15 are certainly just markers in the sand, and, and there's been, you know, uh, obviously a huge amount of government-to-government -government collaboration in this area uh, for many years. Uh, Kathy, I, I wonder, uh, from from uh, the internal workings of of the UNFCCC, has have you seen China and the UK? You know, being well positioned in in the area of green finance, have they both been enthusiastic, um, you know, partakers in this process? Yeah, absolutely, and and especially that um, in negotiations, China is part of a very um, interesting and powerful group called G Seven Seven Plus China. So there's about um, almost 140 parties, which means countries that signed the UN Climate Convention and the Paris Agreement. So and of course, UK uh, this year as the presidency, they will not negotiate, but obviously they they've also shown very huge attention and also, um, you know, and and just earlier this week, uh, they organized. Uh, as the presidency, they organized a call with the civil society stakeholders um, and organizations um, together with the uh, negotiators, head of delegation of, of, of Germany and Canada to talk about how to deliver the $100 billion. So that was also very insightful and also really showed their and, you know, ambition and attention um, to how to deliver the $100 billion and also other agenda items under the whole um, climate finance world. Thanks, Kathy. Um... Antoine, um, Elaine just mentioned the, the the green bonds in in her um, overview. There uh, uh, has HSBC been been involved in in the in the you know green bond market in in China. Uh, I mean, it is I think the world's biggest issuer of of green bonds, or it was in twenty nineteen, as far as I'm aware. Um, is HSBC a, a, a involved out in China in that? Yes, we uh, yeah, good question. We we are involved um, in um, in Hong Kong, um, uh, essentially, where we're you know uh, one of the largest issuers in Hong Kong. Um, as you know, HSBC is uh, is one of the many financial institutions that's playing and uh, playing um, um, a role in this in this field, and and there's a real explosion in the number of green bonds. I think I think we just uh, hit the the one trillion dollar. Um, um, uh, stock of green bonds in um, uh, in circulation, so I think it's it's um, yeah we, we do play a very active role in this. Um, we're a member of the International Capital Markets Association um, uh, Executive Committee um, that you know works on the green bond principles, um, and, and we really try to support investors in the, in, uh, in in this field very actively. And you mentioned that there's been an explosion out in, in, in China in the market. Is that set to continue from your forecasts? Is, what, what trends do you, you see? Are, are, yeah. are we re reaching saturation or, or not yet? No, no, I think it's only the beginning. Um, so one trillion is the cumulative issuance um, globally. Um, and if we look in particular at China, uh, typically, so th there's been a slight reduction uh, last year, and notably because of COVID. You will remember that in the first half of the year, the, the the focus was probably less on green than on other types of of emergency financing that needed to be put in place. Um, so so last year, typically, we saw so, so the total issuance for for China, both offshore and off and onshore, uh, last year in 2020 was 44 billion dollars. Um, which which marked a reduction of 21% um, uh, year on year. Uh, so the, 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 there was quite a sharp fall, and, and clearly we see this fall in the first in the first half of the year of 2020, and then it picked up again in the second half. Um, and and we see no reason why it should it should not continue to grow. Um, uh, green bonds in China represent one percent of the bonds issued in China. Uh, just so you know, so it's uh, it's it's just that there's 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 a, a massive headroom um, uh, 
for growth, considering also that you know the investments and the pressure from the regulator to to become more green and more sustainable. So no, yeah, we, we see a, a promising future for green bonds. And so there, there's you just alluded to the pressure from from up high in terms of um, you know become more sustainable. Um, this is uh, one question I had for for Elaine as well. I wonder if you might um, be able to speak from an investment perspective. How how interested is China's capital market in in sustainability? Um, you know, how much is there coming from the grassroots up as well, or is it all top down policy intervention that's driving this this forward? Thanks, James. Uh, I would say that China is still a top uh, top down uh, uh, country, dri driving by, uh, by policy very heavily. However, these years we also see like the market is actually doing a lot of things through the like market associations. Um, from policies point of view, we definitely see really positive signals, especially entering this year. Uh, we see policies uh, released across different financial reg regulators like. China's central banks, China's securities regulators, and the co corporations regulators on a monthly basis. So in April, like PB, uh, like China's central bank released this new uh, green bond endorsed project catalog, removed uh, fossil fuel uh, or clean coal uh, from the catalog, which is a really big step and also adopt an internationally recognized principle called a no harm principle, uh, which is from the EU principle. Uh, and also uh, strengthening the ESG information disclosure requirements for listed companies. Uh, the recent mandate that China Code for Corporate Governance uh, requires listed companies company to disclose information concerning the environment and corporate performance of social responsibilities, such as uh, poverty elevation. And also in Shanghai, a stock exchange, uh, they uh, increased this shares um, uh, listing rules of shares on the science and innovation board. Uh, also require them to uh, to disclose like social responsibility in the annual reports. Um, in May, CSRC, like China's uh, regular. Um, Securities regulators also amended the content and format requirement for listed company of the ESG reporting, uh, added a new chapter on environmental and social responsibility specifically. This is something really new. Um, yeah, I think it's all very positive from market side. Uh, since 2019, Ch Chinese equity markets uh, open with entering full access uh, with like foreign institution investors uh, entering uh, Chinese market. Um, and also we can see that uh, China has this Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect and Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect. So international investors are entering China, which bringing up like China's Kind of like standards of ES investment requirement. So the market is, I think, is in the beginning of waking up. A lot of like um, investors are realized that corporations realize the uh, responsible investment. So this month, actually, as of like July this year, 67 domestic institutions have signed up the UN principal responsible investment. Uh, including three asset owners. This is a big improvement and as a, as a singling message in Chinese market. Thanks. Thanks, Elin. Um, Antoine, you've got your hands up. You want to come in on that? Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I, well, I completely agree with with what uh, Sir Jelly just said. Um, you know, HSBC commissions a global survey every year uh, on, um, on on market appetite for for green uh, green um, green finance, and and in China we've uh, we've uh, surveyed 180 market participants, both issuers and and investors, and, and clearly we see we I mean. Uh, you know, uh, green and sustainable finance is becoming mainstream in, in China, uh, in, in spite of, of what happened last year with COVID. 72% of the respondents, so a very high number, are open to investing in green and sustainable finance. Um, um, supply chain sustainability is seen as a, a top issue for, for, for China. 90% uh, of the issuers prefer to work with companies that have a sustainable supply chain. Um, and innovation um, for, for, for the market 
innovation will come from finance. Uh, clearly, um, out of out of twelve areas that that were uh, um, covered, uh, clearly finance was was number one um, uh, for sixty nine percent of the respondents, and that's a, yeah. a, an analysis that we a survey that we do every year. So, so yeah, agree. So you're seeing the trend uh, increase yeah. as well year on year. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. Kathy, uh, Kathy, could I bring you in from a, 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 as I previously mentioned, you kind of designated one of these one step greener ambassadors it's all about more more about civic society grassroots going going up rather than necessarily policy coming down uh, you know you're also a chinese lady living in the uk i'm sure you've got lots of chinese friends still in china um you know uk friends in the uk uh from a more individual uh, more individual level what 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 does green finance mean mean for you and and your 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 colleagues and do you think there's a, a difference in you know Antoine has just mentioned that the appetite for green finance in China is definitely increasing. Do you see that just a more anecdotally amongst your your friends and family and you know is there a greater sense of um, feeling like you want to invest in something uh, greener and cleaner now in between UK and China? Do you see differences similarities? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's quite interesting because um, bottom up, like I'm always following the UN process from a civil society perspective view, and then top down also because of my engagement at the UNFCCC has, you know, it's all about policy. So, yeah. so yeah, I think it, it got quite a nice like mixture. And I guess from an individual perspective view, um, so for example, as someone who work in private finance and I interned at a bank this summer, and then I think many private finance institutions are showing ambition, for example, having internal sustainability networks and also organizing events. So in that way, I think the sector, of course, is, is showing their ambition also for individual employees. They care more and more about like reducing personal waste and also not only reducing personal waste, but also they're showing more um, attention in terms of like what the firm is doing and also how do we, for example, aligning our investment um, at the end of the day with the goals of Paris. So I think um, that's another sort of like individual perspective and then from a purely civil society society perspective, I think um, I also agree with what Antoine said that Europe is still absolutely leading on this, even in UN negotiations that EU is absolutely leading. So I think there's quite some catch up to do. But again, I think for many friends of, of mine who, who live in China, I think they've also shown that, you know, that the broader understanding of, of the public on how important this this agenda is is increasing and especially um, mentioning COP15 that China is the host so I think from a government perspective they're also pushing a lot in bringing this agenda like in front of the public eyes. Thanks for that Cathy it's um, all quite positive I think do you think it's happening fast enough you know these these targets that we're we're hearing from you know our governments are are pretty ambitious carbon neutrality 2060 carbon net zero 2050 you shook your head when i when i said it's not is it fast enough please come in you got your hand up yeah i guess um i guess specifically on the 100 billion dollars because that will be a, definitely a highlight of the u.n negotiation on climate um, on climate finance this year. And of course, that was a promise made quite some years ago that was supposed to be met in 2020. Um, and just a brief background about that. So uh, developed countries, which means uh, the Annex 1 parties to the uh, Climate Convention, they were committed to deliver $100 billion per year to developing countries, including, um, you know, like China and also the, the fellow uh, developing countries and least developed countries, LDCs. Uh, but of course, that goal was not met, unfortunately. So the new goal is to meet it this year and to exceed it. And of course, this has been such a strong focus, especially from developing countries, also from civil society. And um, so, yeah, that will be certainly a highlight. But again, like when we look at the uh, national designated um, uh, targets and also the NDCs, I think it's, it's quite certain that the ambition is not high enough. And also NDCs do not stand for our precise prediction. It stands for ambition. So still a long way to go. Thanks. Thanks, Cassie. I don't know, Antoine, um, if you want to come in on that question as to the speed of, of change. Is it, is, it, is it happening fast enough? I mean, we're reading every day about the climate crisis and the, the existential crisis that, that the world essentially is facing. Um, we've got Greta Thunberg, blah, 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 <laughs> the other day. You know, are, are we moving 
quick enough are you seeing fast enough jamie china somewhere that changing so fast from my own experience you know is in this area is it is it changing as quick as it needs to i think we have to be careful what we do, what we wish for uh, i think what's important is that change is happening and change is happening um, as uh, Sir Jane just said, and, and Kathy as well, I mean, uh, the voice comes from the top. Um, and in, when I'm talking from China, the voice comes from the top and, and, and we see a complete change in attitude um, in the main actors of the economy. Um, there is not a single day in my, in my job where I don't talk or exchange uh, with colleagues and, and customers on, uh, on green. This wasn't the case six months ago. Um, um, so, so, so clearly, it's uh, there's there's much, much, much more focus, uh, not only from within HSBC but also from the market. Um, having said this, uh, this is going to take time. Um, you know, you don't change um, a, an economy that is uh, several thousands of years old uh, just like this in in one uh, in one generation. Um, it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of money, um, and 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 uh, and. Probably the third thing, we need to change the way people live um, their everyday life. Um, so what's important is that change is happening. Uh, but change should not happen too fast. You know, today what we read in the press uh, for what's happening in China with the energy, uh, in the energy space, is just a stark reminder that, you know, um, if we go too fast, we may, we may eventually regret it for other, for other reasons. So change is happening. That's good. Let's um, make sure that it's sustainable. Thank you, Antoine. Um, I've I've got one question from um, from our audience, which is: uh, Is there any prospect of a carbon futures market in China? I'm not sure if any of you um, would like to come in on that, or, or 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 perhaps it's something that I should really be asking Mr. Mr. May for who who presented earlier. Um, Mr. May, you've unmuted yourself. That's a good sign. Would you like to, would you like to answer that question? I, this, 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 如果顺利的话呢这个市场主体必须多元化市场化这个碳市场的配合分配方式因此呢当然了
呃，这一天迟早是要来的，至于多长时间，这个还真不好说。但是，呃，我认为未来中国期货市场肯定会推出的。Thank you very much, Mr. May. It's always good to have an expert on hand to ask. Um, so it sounds like we're still early days, but there is a, a kind of early demonstrator going on in, in, in Guangdong um, in that area. But the whole market really needs to diversify um, away from just being about the power sector, which is where it's at right now, um, in order to be able to look at um, carbon futures trading. Um, but it, it, will, it will come at some point. Um, Excellent. Um, I I would like to um, bring the quest the, the, the discussion um, around to another topic. Well, the topic of our next webinar, which is on the thirteenth uh, of October, is going to be um, nature based uh, solutions um, and nature more more broadly um, and its role in um, um, in green finance, I wonder, um, Elaine, if you, you you mentioned biodiversity early earlier on. I just wonder, um, you know, is this uh, nature-based solutions related investment something um, that, that that's developing quickly in China? Is that is that an area? Uh, again, you alluded, but we've not really explored where you see the biggest opportunities for. Uh, UK companies in, in green finance in China to be. Um, I don't know if you want to speak speak a bit more on that, whether biodiversity is, is one of those areas. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, James. Um, yes, uh, from uh, my daily uh, work with the institutions and also the policymakers here, we definitely identify that uh, biodiversity finance is the future uh, focus for Chinese government. Uh, uh, and also at the Currently, uh, it actually, it's the idea is already brought out by Network for Greening the Financial System, which is the central bank network uh, globally. Um, that's why in April, the new study group of this uh, financial uh, biodiversity financial stability uh, has been established, led by actually Dr. Ma Jun, uh, who is representing the uh, G, uh, NG, uh, NGFS uh, for, from the China side, and also Nick Robbins from the UK side for the research uh, angle. Um, I, I definitely think that actually, according to Dr. Ma Jun, we had this uh, discussion previously that uh, in five years time, we see green finance from 15, uh, 2015 and the mainstream now, uh, like in China, uh, it's, it's about like five years time. And in another five years time, biodiversity finance is definitely Definitely the the trend uh, compared to current green finance, uh, the 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 issue remains the same. Is like how do you uh, do the, na na the nature asset pricing? How do you have the quantitative uh, data to support your research and to support the information disclosure? So so given that the TCFD like the task force climate related disclosure, we haven't get the quality data yet how do we bring that on to expand to the nature-based uh, solutions so that remains like in the very very early stage uh, in, in this year in june actually tnfd so which is uh, um, based on tcfd and there's like expanded to nature-based uh, solution called tnfd launched uh, also like uh, the UK is the funding country um, along with other G7 uh, countries. So TNFD is already like coming to talk to, to China, asking like Chinese uh, institutions and financial institutions to provide uh, case studies and on this, I know like China, some of the Chinese banks already signed up to uh, principle for responsible banking, which is a UN a UNEP FI's initiative. One of the uh, guidance is biodiversity guidance. Um, 30 banks have already signed up to that and uh, providing three or four cases how banking is supporting this. Uh, some bank, a Chinese bank, for example, China Construction Bank, Bank of China, are uh, really, really interested in this topic already. However, what we are lack of is the case study on this one. Um, so yes, definitely, I'm confident that this will, uh, we will have like ongoing conversation. And after the COP, we'll see more and more this kind of information uh, going on. But the, the key thing that we, we would like more like UK firms or international firms to provide your expertise if, uh, in these areas, uh, and also UK fi financial institutions to uh, really take this forward and to provide the expertise as well, then there is a big uh, market here in China. 
Thank you, Elin. Uh, Kathy, you've got your hand up. Yeah, and um, MBS, although nature-based solutions is not, um, you know, people always consider it as more of a biodiversity thing, then UNFCCC wouldn't focus on it. But actually, I guess probably two points. One is from the UNFCCC side, uh, the finance committee of the UN Climate Change, which is called Standing Committee on Finance. So they have an annual forum. And this year, the topic is nature-based solutions. So you can also see the attention from the UN on the climate side on, on nature-based solutions. And also, it's so cross-cutting and connects all the uh, conventions, agencies. And also, from a civil society perspective view, I guess, um, from the youth side, it feels like many of them are very supportive, but from a gender perspective, I think many um, gender or, or uh, women-led organizations see the threat of uh, you know, lack of safeguards and also uh, the, the possibility of greenwashing and also neo-colonial offsetting schemes. So I think those have been some worries from, from their side and I'm actually uh, representing um, the youth constituencies of UN climate change and UN biodiversity. Um, at uh, the MBS project of the Chatham House. So I think we've seen quite some discussions and debate um, on this field as well. That's good to hear how, um, how much of a priority it, it, it is within the UNFCCC uh, as well, um, which is clearly, you know, all encompassing. Um, uh, Elaine, I, we, we've only got a few minutes left um, before we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, Elaine, you mentioned about um, the, the banking uh, sector there. Antoine, uh, you work for a bank. Um, what what impact has 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 all of this um, increased um, focus on sustainability really had from a, a practical perspective on what what banks in in China uh, or, or elsewhere are are actually having to uh, deliver for your for your customers? What what kind of changes just uh, in two minutes. Um, uh, so, wait, uh, go ahead, go ahead, please, please. I go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. um, look, I see, I see, um, I see, I, I see three three impacts. One, a relationship with our with our regulators. Um, there, there's um, there's not a shift, but there's a, clearly a new a new conversation that we have with regulators around around sustainability. And it's uh, and it's and it's 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 interesting because it's a lot of you know um, trying to understand the you know the issue the problem and 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 the challenges of of sustainability. It's something new, and it's new for many people uh, uh, in China. So let's all get around the table and think of the of the of 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 the challenge and the potential solutions. So I think one one is one is this um, two uh, product development. We are innovating. Um, I would say not 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 every day, but but clearly uh, uh, very aggressively with new product solutions. Um, we've um, you know typically if we take HSBC, you know we've launched uh, green bonds, uh, sustainable supply chain, um, um, uh, sustainable sustainability linked bonds, and, and everything. So so there's a lot of there's a lot of new products being being created at the moment. And three. Um, <laughs> You know, going down our value chain, um, uh, our customers, our customers. Uh, there's a clearly a big demand from our customers for for uh, for this. Um, partly, you know, if you take our Chinese customers, um, partly because again, uh, voice from the top, uh, you need you need to do more green. Um, and when it comes to multinationals or foreigners in in China, uh, again, there's a lot of um, impetus coming from from the head office. So it's um, it's it's clearly a, a, yeah it's it, yeah it's changing the way we do business yeah for sure, and this is for for you know external parties us in our operations and that's an important piece as well, in our operations um, you know HSBC committed to become net zero in 2050, um, globally and in China as well. So we we are progressively changing the way we do things. You know we're aiming for. Uh, zero paper, for example, uh, as as a start, but progressively, you know, we'll be looking at our scope one, two, and three, and um, and 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 trying to 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 change the way we do things. So yeah, it's a radical change for us. Thank you, Antoine. Um, we only have a minute left. Um, I, I might <laughs> no, no, that's that's perfect. Um, I might just offer Kathy and Elena thirty seconds each to to. To give any final final thoughts on on the topic, any final 
things to look out for at COP26, maybe. Um, we've already had quite a few announcements, maybe. I don't know if you were, you're aware of any more that we should be looking at. Um, Cathy, to you, to you first. Yeah, I guess um, besides, of course, nature-based solutions, besides uh, the $100 billion, I guess another probably topic that uh, countries will focus on is about allocating 50% of total climate finance to adaptation, which I think um, countries may not have that strong ambition on that, but civil society definitely does. And also um, the lack of attention on loss and damage, which is also, I guess, another topic that will be discussed. Um, so yeah, but thanks so much for, for organizing this and it's really um, great to, to communicate and, and also to share views. Thank you, Cathy. It's been great to have you. Um, Elaine, any final words? Yes, uh, thanks, James. Uh, given that because we are managing a technical uh, program here, so I really would like to say that uh, there are a lot of initiatives globally in, in terms of COP for financial institutions and also institutions to sign up. Uh, but the technical base, like for some science-based target and the, how financial institutions to do like scope uh, three uh, disclosure is really key to help China to build up the confidence to sign up this uh, kind of ambitious uh, uh, initiative. So uh, we are really providing this kind of technical assistance to, uh, to the institutions here and also welcome the more international like, experts to join this, to support this initiative. Um, and uh, thank you very much for this. I think this is a really, really useful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And Mr. May, um, thank you to um, any, any final, final words from you.非常非常感谢啊，杰姆斯邀请我们这个，我还是是一句话说了，这个中国现在做这个碳市场，确确实是还是有很大很大的压力的，因为中国现在这个发展中国家，呃，这个但是确确实中国因为具备世界上最大的